The law of Moses has ended. This is what mainstream Christianity teaches and what I believe as well. But of course, our friends in the Hebrew Roots Movement completely reject this idea. They challenge it by saying, where does it say that? Show me where in the Bible it says that the law of Moses has come to an end. Okay, let's do that. The theology of Torahism teaches that followers of Jesus are required to keep the law of Moses. And today we're going to look at some scriptural evidence that shows just the opposite, that the law of Moses has ended and therefore Torahism is a false theology. And, and let me clear up one thing right off the bat. When I refer to the law of Moses, I'm talking about the set of commands that God gave to the nation of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. This is what scripture refers to as the law of Moses. And as I'm about to demonstrate from scripture, the Mosaic law with its ceremonial commands for feasts and, and kosher food and Saturday Sabbath and circumcision is not required of followers of Christ. Those things have never been forbidden or, or prohibited, so they're permitted, but they're not required under the new covenant. Now, there are a number of New, uh, new Testament passages that show that the law of Moses has ended, and today we're going to break down a lesser-known passage in 2 Corinthians that doesn't even use the word law and see what it teaches. In Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, we find a discussion about how Christians are ministers of the New Covenant. This is the topic of chapter 3. And there's a short passage in this chapter that I believe presents an insurmountable challenge to Hebrew Roots theology. Verses 7 through 18 talk about the greater glory of the New Covenant. And it's the first five verses of this section that we're going to look at today. So let's first read it through, starting at verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. There you have it. This passage says that the law of Moses has ended. Not convinced yet? Okay, let's break it down. So verse 7 begins with a reference to something called the ministry of death, which is described as carved in letters on stone. What is that a reference to? Well, when a first century audience heard a Jewish teacher like Paul use the phrase carved in letters on stone, they would have immediately thought of Exodus 31, which says, And he, God, gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. The giving of the law at Mount Sinai was the central event in the history of the nation of Israel. And the book of Exodus reveals that it was God's finger that carved the letters of the law on the stone tablets. So the phrase carved in letters on stone here in 2 Corinthians 3.7 refers to the law of Moses. And Paul calls that law the ministry of death. Those are strong words. Now, he didn't mean that the Mosaic law literally kills us, of course. He's referring to the fact that the law can't save us. As he teaches elsewhere, it can only identify or reveal our sin and condemn us. Okay, so verse 7 says, Now if the ministry of death carved in, in letters on stone, in other words, if the law of Moses came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So Paul is contrasting the glory of the Mosaic law, which was written on stone by the finger of God, with something he calls the ministry of the Spirit. Now, there are a couple things to point out here. First, although the Mosaic law is called a ministry of death in this passage, it was attended by the glory of God, 
So the law of Moses isn't some ancient pointless code that we can just toss out. As Romans 7 says, it was holy and righteous and good. It's just that the law of Moses was never intended to provide salvation, and it was never intended to last forever. Second, Paul refers to the fact that God's glory was reflected in Moses' face at the giving of the law. Now, he's talking about Exodus 34, where after being in God's presence to receive the law from him, Moses' face shone so brightly that the Israelites were afraid to get close to him. He had to put on a veil. And if the law of Moses came with such amazing glory, Paul asks, how much more glory will the ministry of the Spirit have? He's teaching the superiority of the ministry of the Spirit over the law of Moses. So, what does Paul mean by the ministry of the Spirit? Well, he commonly uses the the terminology of the Spirit to refer to the ministry of Jesus and the New Covenant in contrast to the Mosaic Law and the Sinai Covenant. Let's look at a few examples of that. Romans 2.29 says, Circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. So he's contrasting the spirit with the written code, which, of course, is another reference to the Mosaic Law. Romans 7, 6 says, We serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. That's the same contrast here, the spirit versus law. Romans 8, 2, Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And here's a contrast between what Paul calls the law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death, which echoes our passage in 2 Corinthians 3, which calls the Mosaic law the ministry of death. And in Galatians 5.18, Paul presents a very clear contrast between the Spirit and the law. He says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And for our last example, let's jump, jump back to 2 Corinthians 3 here. A few verses before the passage we're looking at today, Paul tells the church at Corinth, You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Here's another contrast between tablets of stone, a reference to the law of Moses, and what Paul calls tablets of human hearts, which is a reference to the new covenant in which God promised to write his law on our hearts. And Paul carries this idea forward into verses 7 and 8, where he applies that same idea of contrasting Jesus and Moses, the the new covenant and the old covenant. And he's essentially saying, If the law of Moses came with such glory that the Israelites couldn't look at Moses' face because of it, how much more glory does the ministry of Christ have? And Paul includes a significant point in verse 7 that we don't want to miss. He refers to the glory on Moses' face as being brought to an end. Now, Scripture doesn't say how long Moses had to wear a veil, but after the giving of the law, it's never mentioned again. And here in 2 Corinthians, Paul's teaching that, at some point, the reflection of God's radiant glory on Moses' face came to an end. And he's linking that idea to the temporary nature of the Mosaic Law. In other words, when God gave the law to Moses, it was accompanied by God's glory. And just like the radiant glow on Moses' face eventually ended, so would the law that came with it. So while the law of Moses was holy and righteous and good, it was also temporary just like the glow on Moses' face. All right, let's continue on. Verse 9 says, For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. And here's another contrast. Paul's comparing two ministries, the ministry of condemnation and the ministry of righteousness. And the connecting phrase there, for if, tells us that Paul is carrying forward that comparison that he had introduced in verses 7 and 8. As he often does, he's stating the same thing in a different way for emphasis. Notice the repetition of themes here. In verse 7, he referred to the law of Moses as the ministry of death. And in verse 9, he calls it the ministry of condemnation. And in verse 7, he referred to the ministry of Christ as the ministry of the Spirit. And in verse 9, he calls it the ministry of righteousness. So he's saying there was glory in the law of Moses, but the ministry of Jesus is far more glorious. Jesus and the new covenant 
are superior to Moses in the Old Covenant. And Paul carries this contrast forward into the last two uh, verses of our passage. Verse 10, Indeed, in this case, what once had glory, again, meaning the, the law of Moses, which came with such glory that the Israelites couldn't look at the glowing face of Moses, right? What once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it, speaking of Jesus. For if what was being brought to an end, another reference to the law of Moses, which came to an end, just like the glow on Moses' face, if what was being brought to an end claim, came with glory, much more will what is permanent, meaning the ministry of Christ, have glory. So in Hebrew literature, when, when the author wants to really emphasize a point, they use repetition. We see this all throughout the Old Testament, and we see it here in this passage in spades. The point Paul is emphasizing is that the ministry of Jesus is superior to and far more glorious than the law of Moses. And in this five-verse passage, Paul says the same thing four times in a row. Check it out. Number one, if the ministry of death came with such glory, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Number two, if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Number three, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. And number four, if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. <laughs> Paul's not even being subtle about this, right? And this is exactly what the book of Hebrews teaches. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs, referring to the Levitical priests under the Mosaic law, as the covenant of which he is mediator, the new covenant, is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises. In other words, the ministry and covenant God established through Moses are inferior to the ministry and covenant that God established through Jesus. And the author of Hebrews ends chapter 8 with this statement. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one, the Mosaic covenant, obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And just a few years after these words were written, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the old covenant and its law became obsolete and vanished away. Torahism wants to teach us that Christians today are required to keep the law of Moses. But look at the way Paul describes the law of Moses in our passage. Ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, ministry of condemnation, came with great glory, was being brought to an end. He says that twice in this passage. What once had glory came to have no glory at all. So 2 Corinthians 3 verses 7 through 11 teach that the law of Moses has been outshined and come to an end because of the exceedingly glorious and far superior ministry of Christ. Again, the law of Moses wasn't bad or wrong. It was holy and righteous and good but it was always intended to be temporary, and it's inferior to the surpassing glory of Jesus. So let me wrap up by offering my own paraphrase of what our passage teaches. If the law of Moses came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of it, how much more glory does the ministry of Christ have? There was glory in the law, but the righteousness of Jesus far exceeds it. In fact, the law, which enjoyed temporary glory, has ended, and it's been surpassed by the glory of Christ, which will never end. Thanks for watching. Shalom.